Chapter 13 Once back in the apple, I called his unholiness and told him to sit tight for a couple of days while I analyzed 16 hours of audio and vid data, which had turned out to be very revealing indeed, but extremely disturbing as well. After having been serviced by his buxom blonde friend at the now infamous hoity-toity Strong Island Shindig, K-Boy had gone back downstairs to discuss business with the Colombians. He said that he thought the product was grade B, and that if they'd up the quality, he'd take 20 keys for starters. This was an acceptable proposition for the cartel reps, and the deal was sealed. Details were to be discussed at a later date. The feds would have to be called in if he was going to get popped on that gig. I most deaf wasn't going to fuck with the Colombians. That would be entirely up to Mr. Mayor. Special K and Sweet P were apparently on a new kick. It's called gasping, which in a nutshell combines sexual orgasm with near asphyxia. Cute. Whatever floats your boat, as they say, but the trick is not to hurt anybody and most deaf not to snuff them. Don't play with fire unless you want to get burned. And it looked like these third degree burns were going to get Special K the third degree and way more than he'd bargained for. The recording was a little garbled because Special K had obviously taken off his jacket and probably everything else to party with Sweet Pea and Miss Philippines. Three-way panting, grunting, groaning, and moaning. All the audio attributes of no-holds-barred sex were present, followed by disquieting, soft, choking sounds and spooky lulls as Sweet Pea and Special K both got off respectively. Now it was Miss Philippines' turn. You see, there's nothing to it, said Special K. It's such a rush, Sweet Pea chimed in. Okay, I'll try it, but I'm kind of scared. Go easy, okay, said their hapless prey. Lots of foreplay and lots more moaning and groaning as the two sanctimonious sexual predators worked her over real good. The choke, the lull. Oh my God, she passed out, said Sweet Pea. Don't worry, she'll be all right. Want a line, said Special K nonplussed. You sure she's okay, Johnny? Sure, she'll be fine. Just let her sleep it off. I don't know, Johnny. It doesn't look like she's breathing. Oh, fuck. Oh, shit. What the fuck? Oh, my God, said Sweet Pea, whimpering uncontrollably. Look what you've done. Shut up, barked our boy wonder. This dialogue was followed by the sounds of clumsy successful attempts at CPR by both parties. Sweet Pea was very upset and getting hysterical. Shut up! yelled Special K. We've got to get her out of here. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! She's dead! You killed her! I said, shut up, you stupid bitch. Now you're an accessory. So help me get her dressed, and let's get her out of here into the car. Sweet Pea was crying and whimpering, shuffling sounds and white noise. That was the end of the recording. Our boy obviously hadn't taken the time to put his jacket back on. Three days ago, she'd been found by a jogger a few miles away from the mansion on a barren stretch of beach. An investigation was now in full swing. The mayor had to sit down when I briefed him on the new developments. He appeared faint when he listened to the gasping snuff tape and subsequently viewed Sweet Pea getting down with the deceased prior to the gasping episode. He broke out in a cold sweat, paled visibly, shifting about uncomfortably in his throne. This was way more than he'd bargained for, and I hadn't even had time to mention the Colombians. You've got to get her away from here, West, far away from here and him, ASAP. Is that understood, West? He almost bellowed with bogus bravado as he inwardly crumbled. I even felt a little sorry for the big cheese. This was some seriously fucked up shit. You've got to get her out of the country. Leave today. I have an apartment in Paris. I'll pay you another 20000 just to get her over there and see to it that she stays out of trouble for a while. He was almost babbling, but it made sense. Fifty cash, I said. Done, he replied with a wince. I then informed him of the imminent business transactions between Johnny and the cartel creeps. This seemed to interest him a great deal. He picked up the phone and dialed the FBI immediately. It looked like Johnny might go down hard on a sniff-and-snuff rap that even Jonathan Thurston Powell II wouldn't be able to get him out of. See ya, wouldn't want to be ya. The tricky part for our fearless leader, of course, was going to be keeping Sweet Pea from getting implicated, 
which was probably next to impossible, but I kept my mouth shut. Within three hours I was on my way to the airport with two first-class Air France tickets in hand, a sullen, weepy woman-child at my side, and a whole lot of cash on my person. This wasn't necessarily my idea of fun, but the pay was good, and I sure liked traveling in style. The flight was relaxing and luxurious. The service was exceptional, and the stewardesses were attractive and charming. I tanked up on champagne, wine, and a tasty meal with seconds, then watched three consecutive crummy movies as Sweet Pea slept a desperate tranquilizer-fueled sleep at my side, wrapped in a blanket and wearing blinders. I took Queen Bee Stewardess's number. Her name was Nicole, and she seemed hot to trot. I asked her what days she had off and told her I'd call her soon. Paris, what a town. Ooh la la. Dig it, daddy-o. Chapter 14 We went to a nice but discreet hotel above La Villa Jazz Club in Saint-Germain-des-Prés. I called the big cheese on my sat phone from the Jardin de Luxembourg and didn't tell him where we were staying. I wanted to check out his apartment and its environs before we moved in. We had separate rooms to be sure. I disconnected her room phone and locked her in. There'd be no calling Special K on my watch and no funny business either. I gave her a cheap cell phone only good for local calls with only my number in memory and encouraged her to take a couple more tranquilizers and confiscated the rest. Anything might be on the mayor's agenda. You couldn't put anything past him at this point. Major political players are capable of just about anything when their careers are on the line. I kept thinking, take the money and run. But professional ethics and a vague sense of moral responsibility prevailed. I went downstairs and caught a set at La Villa. The cats were smoking. Bobby Few at the piano, J.J. Avenel on the bass, and John Betch on drums. The late, great Steve Lacey's rhythm section. Man, what a great trio. They opened the set with a Thelonious Monk composition, Well You Needn't, with the correct bridge changes and melodic figures, followed by Duke's A Single Petal of a Rose, and closed the set with Bud Powell's Un Poco Loco, the cats were glad to see me and invited me to sit in on the next set. We played A Night in Tunisia, Body and Soul, and Monk's Balu Bolivar, Balu's R. Fun was had by all, and I blew my ass off if I do say so myself. It had been quite a while since I'd been able to trip the light fantastic with musicians of their caliber. What a groove. Drinks are on me once again. I was Royal Obar. I called Sweet Pea's phone at 10 a.m. A groggy young female voice answered tentatively. I asked if she wanted to join me for breakfast. She said she'd be ready in half an hour. We had coffee, hot chocolate, and croissant at Les Deux Magots, one of the most famous cafés in Paris, and where Jean-Paul Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir had written some of their finest works, sipping countless espressos and cognacs. There's a lot of history in this town. Our girl was wearing a permanent frown, and the coat Jones was probably hitting her pretty hard by now. Not to mention a heavy dose of post-traumatic stress disorder compounded by monumental guilt and fear. It was her vacant stare that was the most disturbing. It was as if she were pure alpha wave and devoid of any discernible emotion. I certainly didn't envy her present state of mind and tried to be as upbeat as possible. I told her she'd have to stay under house arrest for a few hours while I checked out Daddy's crib. I bought her some bread, wine, cheese, and a basket of fruit, then locked her in again for the duration. I called my old friend Gérard, a veteran mad dog war correspondent, who was one of the big kahunas at a major French news magazine, a rough and considerably done-down equivalent being our Newsweek. He played poker with some pretty serious underworld savvy cats on a regular basis, I needed to get a hold of some of the tools of my trade pronto and find an inside track on Mr. Mayer's plans and Parisian allegiances. We met for a few beers and he gave me the desired digits. It was great to see him. He was on his fifth wife and seemed relatively content for a manic depressive. He told me that he still went to the hot spots but that the thrill was gone and that he only continued to go through the motions so as to prevent some of the more threatening young bucks from rising through the ranks. Whatever. But at least he was lucid and candid about it. 
I regaled him with some stories from previous cases, but refrained from revealing anything about the one at hand. What you don't know can't hurt you. He has a wonderful and extremely ironic sense of humor that only a Russian could rival. We had downed quite a few beers with gusto, and it was time to get on with our respective lives and duties. We emptily promised to meet again soon. First things first. I needed to get a piece and an encrypted cell phone. I locked her in for the night and went to meet my connection near the Canal Saint-Martin. This area is quite desolate in the wee small hours, mostly populated by the denizens of the crack trade, or the ghost people as I call them. My man showed up on time at the designated spot, and I purchased an untraceable Beretta 9mm with silencer, two extra clips, 200 rounds of ammo, and an encrypted cell phone for a thousand euros. Not a bad deal for Paris. I was back at the hotel within an hour feeling pretty smug and a lot safer. Safety knows no season. The mayor's crib was in the 17th arrondissement, near the Vagram metro station. It was a classy 19th century building replete with swanky courtyard, refurbished antique elevator, and the whole nine yards. His apartment was on the fifth floor. I let myself in and proceeded to check out the scene. It was a great pad, at least 300 square meters, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, a spacious living room with a patio-sized balcony, a nice Parisian rooftop view, and to top things off, a large, well-equipped modern kitchen. The decor was sober and tasteful. I could get used to this, I thought, as I checked the whole place thoroughly for bugs. The scene was clean, then made some calls on my new phone. I strategically placed a few discreet minicams, left the lights and TV on, and headed back to Saint-Germain and Sweet Pea, whose real name was Laura, by the way. I checked on Laura first thing upon returning to the hotel. Predictably, she was still despondent, confused, emotionally inaccessible, and plagued with unassuageable guilt, none of which she mentioned, all of which I tacitly understood. She'd finished the wine and had eaten some food, which was a good sign. I decided to take her to Chartier. It doesn't get more French than that. It's a noisy, popular, old-school brasserie-style restaurant in the Grand Boulevard area of northern Paris that must have well over a hundred years of history. I'm quite sure that Toulouse-Lautrec must have dined here from time to time before his legendary forays to the Moulin Rouge. We took the metro and arrived around eight, and were lucky to get a table in that great big mess hall of a restaurant. I ordered a steak frite and a salad for her, fries, salad, and a cheese plate for me. The house wine was a mistake and would have eaten the enamel right off your teeth. So I ordered a Saint-Emilion Mélisimé, 2009. Wow, what a difference that wine made. Conversation was predictably minimal, kind of like trying to talk to a difficult and sullen adolescent. She had only a vague notion of her surroundings and geographic location. But I plowed on stoically, with various and sundry historical Parisian trivia. We took our time whining and dining, then took a taxi back to the hotel because she was half in the bag and it was time to tuck her in for the night. She was remarkably docile considering. No wonder she had been so easy for Special K to manipulate. She seemed to be completely devoid of core personality. Of course, drug-addled PTSD probably had a lot to do with it, too. I asked her if she wanted to speak to her old man. She preemptorily declined and retired moodily to her quarters. I called his majesty, gave him an update, and told him that I was willing to babysit his delinquent daughter for a month or so, but then that she'd be on her own. What she really needed was maximum security rehab, which could and should be arranged. The prick was noncommittal at best. Just as I'd thought, baby doll's welfare wasn't his number one priority. Some people just shouldn't have children. He then asked me why we weren't staying at his crib, and I countered with how come he knew we weren't. Suddenly, at a loss for words, he attempted to change the subject, saying that Special K had skipped town and was wanted for questioning. Why didn't that surprise me? What a stupid move. It was like saying, catch me if you can. That kind of behavior always attracted a cop's attention big time. The kid was dumber than I thought. All of his reprehensible and dangerous shenanigans to date had probably all been to get distant daddy's attention. 
He was just another upper crust, spoiled, emotionally deficient latchkey kid with an attitude and a half. One could be sure that by this time JPT Sr. must be privy to some of the story or stories. It made me wonder what kind of mutant rabbits he was going to pull out of his immaculate Mad Hatter hat when he found out how deep the ocean of doo-doo in which his son was now embroiled was. My new priority was to find out who had been watching the apartment and why. I made a few calls and a 10 a.m. appointment with a French private investigator who had come highly recommended. His name was Marcel Dussapin.